Late on Saturday night, two Canadians were released from jail in Cairo, Egypt. Tarek Lubani and John Grayson had been in prison for close to two months since they were arrested in a Muslim Brotherhood riot in Cairo, where about 100 people were killed. These two Canadians were not tourists in Egypt who just happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. This wasn't an accident. They're professional protesters who travel the world looking for political trouble. You've heard of eco-tourism or even foodie tourism? Well, this is riot tourism. They chose to go there on purpose to be part of the fight. In fact, that Cairo riot wasn't even their first choice. They wanted to go to the Gaza Strip, an urban area of about 1.5 million people wedged between Israel and Egypt that is run by the terrorist group Hamas, which is a Muslim Brotherhood affiliate. They enforce Sharia law in the Gaza Strip. Lubani and Grayson were going to demonize Israel, as they had done before. But this time, the Egyptian government wouldn't let them cross into Gaza because Egypt is pretty much at war with the Muslim Brotherhood these days. It's a brutal civil war that has cost hundreds of lives. So instead of coming back to Canada or just hanging out by the hotel pool or going, pool or going to tour the pyramids, Lubani and Grayson chose to go to a riot. I know that's crazy, but these two men are bizarre. Grayson is with a group called Queers Against Israel Apartheid, which is just weird because Israel is actually the only country in the Middle East where it's safe to be gay. In fact, there's about 500 gay Arabs in Tel Aviv who were refugees from the West Bank and Gaza Strip because they'd be honor killed under Sharia law back home. Being gay is punishable by death in most of the Muslim world. Anyways, after Canada's foreign minister, John Baird, pressured his Egyptian counterparts, they finally released the two men from jail. Although last I checked, they still weren't able to get out of Cairo because they're on a no-fly list or something else like that. I don't know. I mean, gee, who would have thunk it? Participating in riots organized by the Muslim Brotherhood terrorist group would make airlines a little iffy about inviting you on their airplanes. Anyways, I wrote my column in the Sun newspapers on this subject over the weekend, and I reported again on the fact uh, that when Lubani and Grayson were arrested, they had in their possession two little remote control helicopter drones with miniature high-definition video cameras called GoPros. Now, the only reason I knew about this is because Grayson and Lubani's supporters published this fact on their, on their website. They had kept it a secret for over a month, but they said they thought they were going to be charged in relation to the riot, and Egyptian prosecutors were going to reveal their possession of these drones. So they wanted to tell their supporters about them first and to explain that they were for delivering medicine. Yeah, that's the ticket for delivering medicine by drone. Maybe that's what this Syrian government drone was doing, captured by Syrian rebels recently. It's a remote control helicopter drone equipped with little cameras, just like they use in Libya's Civil War II. You'd have to be pretty thick to think this was for delivering medicine, thick or in league with the rioters like most of Canada's media party is. See, I wanted to give you the update that Lubani and Grayson are out of jail, and I've just done that. But to me, the reaction by the media party this weekend when they were released was just as newsworthy. The universal joy, the cheering, the full-out PR spinning for Lubani and Grayson by the press gallery was striking. I mean, normally Canadian reporters pretend to be reporters, just the facts, just telling you the news. You can make up your mind for yourself. <laughs> but not this weekend. They were jubilant, but not just jubilant. They were vicious towards the only journalist in the entire country who had been reporting the actual facts about Lubani and Grayson instead of just cheerleading for them, too. They were furious that I dared to report about their serial protesting, their extreme politics, their anti-Israel bigotry, Lubani's various arrests, and especially about the contradictions in their alibi. Seriously, Saturday night, one of the Globe and Mail's star columnists a gossip columnist for them named Tabitha Southey wrote that she was literally crying when she heard of Lubani's and Grayson's release. She was also writing that she was going for a drink. So perhaps it was the alcohol speaking, but then out of the blue, with no provocation or interaction from me at all, she just blurted out on Twitter, F you, Ezra Levant. Whoa, easy done it. I mean, that's just the sixth white wine spritzer talking, I'm sure. I mean, maybe she was just drunk tweeting and meant to swear at her ex-husband and the source of her unearned riches, Dave Foley. Remember him? He was with the kids in the hall and news radio. Here's Foley talking about his ex-wife. I've paid $17,700 
a month. Um, but yeah, no, I was ordered by Canadian court to pay like what at that point was about five times my income every month in child support, which was based on my earnings when I was doing news radio. Um, and I don't know if you've checked the listings. It hasn't been on for 12 years. Yeah, I live. I live in a very, you know, live in a, a small loft in downtown LA, and you know, and my family in Toronto lives in a two and a half million dollar house on a park. Yeah, I thought maybe that Tabitha was saying "f you" to to him, but no, no, she she meant me. This is the Globe and Mail's fanciest columnist, their prettiest voice, their most articulate critic, telling me to f off because I wasn't joining in the emotional orgy of the rest of the media party, literally crying for these two pro-Hamas sympathizers being released from jail, where they had been in prison for, for rioting. Uh, and a bit later in the night, maybe another drink to the wind, Southey so wrote this. Despite our political differences, if Ezra Levant's life was at risk in the hands of a violent foreign government, I'd do all I could to save him. Really? Is that true? Because Tabitha Southey doesn't have to wait for me to be arrested in a foreign country because at any moment in time, there are approximately 2,000 Canadians held in jails overseas. There are right now. And frankly, most of them deserve to be there for smuggling drugs or committing thefts or sexual offenses, even occasionally murder. Some of them are in prison for political reasons, though, like Hussein Salil, a Canadian who has been held in a Chinese jail since 2006 on trumped-up charges. But Southey has never wept for Hussein Salil or clicked like on a Facebook page for him, or had a wine and cheese party with lots and lots of wine for him, because he's not sexy and cool. Unlike Lubani and Grayson, he hasn't smeared the conservative government. Uh, Hussein Salil hasn't smeared Israel. He's not a sexy filmmaker like Grayson is. This film you're looking at now, a soft gay porn flick, is what Grayson does when he's not demonizing Israel. He's a sexy guest to have at your cocktail party, Hussein Salil, on the other hand, probably doesn't even speak English well and certainly couldn't hold up a conversation about the season finale of Breaking Bad or Mad Men. See, for Saudi, I think it's all about being fashionable. I'm guessing she lives in a fashionable house. She has a fashionable celebrity ex-husband. She eats at the fashionable restaurants in Toronto. Perhaps Lubani and Grayson are fashion ornaments for her. I mean, she really couldn't give a damn about the other 2,000 schmoes out there in foreign jails. But here's what I was wondering. In the 50 days of Southey's slacktivism, you know, of her clicking on Facebook pages and tweeting from the local wine bar about how much she deeply cared, she had never told the Egyptian dictatorship to F off. She never said those words to them. So why was she so vicious to me? I hadn't interacted with her in any way. I hadn't talked to her, I hadn't mentioned her at all. Why did she hate me more than she hated Lubani and Grayson's jailers? Oh, and it wasn't just her. Literally dozens of other journalists in the media party retweeted her F.U. note to me. They, they agreed with her. Why? Uh, some said that my reports in The Sun were speculation. They were questioning my facts. But my facts were all sourced, many of them from Lubani and Grayson's own website or from websites of groups affiliated with them. It's not a matter of opinion that they were arrested with those drones. It's not a matter of opinion that they chose to keep that a secret for more than a month and then revealed it only when they thought Egypt would first. It's not a matter of speculation whether or not they're anti-Israel activists or that Lubani has been arrested in London, Ontario, and arrested in Israel. It wasn't that my journalism was shoddy. So why so antagonistic? Why so vicious? Why swearing at me in a way that they did not swear even at the Egyptian dictators? Well, Murdoch Davis, a former senior editor at the Toronto Star, summed it up pretty well in one tweet, too. He said, getting activists out of foreign jails in countries Canadians are warned to avoid is noble, but it's not journalism. Exactly. Now, I don't think that springing two professional pro provocateurs who support a Hamas dictatorship in Gaza, I actually don't know how noble it is to spring them from jail at all. I'd probably focus on the poor schmoes who were set up with a few ounces of drugs by the Mexican federales or that Chinese-Canadian Hussein Salil that I mentioned. But fine. If you want to bring back the two celebrities, fine. But don't call that activism. Don't call that journalism. And that is why Tabitha Southey and the rest of the media party hated my real journalism. Because it cast doubt on the nobility of their mission. 
Southey and friends propagated the myth that these two boys were saints, humanitarians, and Egypt was just being a bully. Being part of a riot with surveillance gear contradicts that narrative. That's why Tabitha Southey hates me. Not just because I was doing journalism that she wasn't, but that my journalism might erode her self-regard, her own self of righteousness and holiness, that she was, uh, you know, that these two were saints, for, and that she was a saint for having clicked like on a Facebook page to free them. Tabitha Southey so enjoyed crying at Lubani and Grayson's relief that she felt she had to tell the whole world she was crying. Uh, of course she did, because she wanted to prove to the whole world that although she didn't actually lift a finger for them, she cared more than anyone else. I mean, she cried and you didn't, so she's better than you. Pretty clear who the Mother Teresa of Toronto is, right? But if these two professional protesters in Cairo were up to no good, it means that Saudi herself wasn't as much of a saint for supporting them, right? So she can't let those facts out there, can she? Perhaps I ruined plans for a fancy welcome home party? I mean, she really couldn't show them off to all her fancy friends if they were morally dirty, could she? You know, sometime when I talk about the media party, people say, Ezra, you're exaggerating. You're overdoing it. You're making it up. Really? Point out a single other news source talking about these two who even told you about the video drones, let alone about their political extremism. Did another media outlet ever tell you about Lubani having to be arrested by cops in London, Ontario for screaming at a Canadian cabinet minister and refusing to leave when asked by security? Of course not, because that makes it tougher for the media party to feel noble. Saudi pretends she's a feminist. <laughs> it's easy when you demand big checks from your ex-husband, isn't it? But even she couldn't stomach Lubani screaming at Diane Finlay, a female cabinet minister, for almost an hour. Tabitha Southey would probably call that sexual assault if it were done by anybody else. Of course Tabitha Southey hates me. I report facts that contradict the team. One other media party comment was that my reports about these drones could endanger Lubani and Grayson, as in, come on, man, be part of the team. Don't report facts that could have any impact on the world might lead to charges. Now, it's a ridiculous argument to begin with. The Egyptians already knew about the drones. They seized them when Lubani and Grayson were arrested. Lubani and Grayson just kept it a secret from the media party so as not to confuse their love affair. And as if I'm supposed to be on the team of pro-Hamas Israel haters who get caught up in a riot in Cairo. Sorry, I'm not on that team. But, but let's say that I was the only person in the world that knew about these video drones. The media party was telling me that I shouldn't publish or report those facts, even if they're true, because that might make it harder for these two people to get sprung out of jail. In other words, I'm supposed to self-censor, to hide the truth from Canadians, like they are, in the service of some radical political agenda? Of course, I didn't comply with this team censorship, but everyone else did. That is the media party, and it's ugly. Last point. More ugly Canadians ruining our reputation around the world. Greenpeace sends a ship to attack a Russian oil rig in the Arctic Ocean. The Greenpeace ship, of course, is fueled by heavy oil. What, did you think unicorn dust was in there? Heavy oil is a fossil fuel. Just think about the staggering hypocrisy for a moment. But, but what did the ship do? Did they just issue a press release? Take embarrassing photographs of the Russians doing bad things like polluting? Maybe play some Russian language messages on a loudspeaker? <laughs> no. They interfered with the rig. They tried to board it with grappling hooks. They tried to break and enter on the high seas. It's similar to Grace and Lubani, isn't it? Media hounds celebrities who think the law doesn't apply to them, who are used to the kid glove treatment back here at home, going abroad to break the law in more serious places. When Greenpeace broke into the Calgary Tower a few years back, police actually helped them by holding back traffic to protect them. <laughs> There were minor criminal charges laid, but nothing more than a slap on the wrist. Just like when Lubani screamed at Cabinet Minister Diane Finlay. Huh, you try screaming at a cabinet official in Cairo or Moscow. See how that goes down. So Greenpeace is shocked, genuinely I think, that everyone on their boat has been arrested, put in jail, and now faces charges of piracy that could come with a 15-year prison term in Russia. And Russia, unlike Egypt, really doesn't give a fig about what Western ambassadors have to say, do they? I mean, Egypt is a mess. It's isolated diplomatically. It's in a financial mess. It's desperate for friends. It's a civil war. 
yeah, sure, they'll release a couple of prisoners if Canada asks nicely and turns some screws. But Vladimir Putin is the arms dealer to Syria and Iran. He's the bully of the United Nations, the authoritarian boss who just stared down Barack Obama on Syrian use of nerve gas. Do you think he gives a damn about what Greenpeace or their political friends are going to do to Russia or beg or demand of them? Look, I am not an expert in the Russian laws of piracy, but I can imagine they roughly entail the forceful breach of the integrity of a vessel at sea. It doesn't have to be Captain Hook style where they plunder your gold. I mean, illegally boarding or commandeering a, commandeering a vessel or a drilling rig to disrupt, vandalize, and endanger operations or even lives, yeah. I'm sorry, that does strike me as a bit of a case of piracy. I mean, 15 years does sound tough to me, but I'm a liberal Canadian. These people sailed to Russia, a country run by an ex-KGB agent. What did they expect? Oh, and no, before you ask, no, Tabitha Sally doesn't give a damn about them. But you know what? Let me surprise you a bit. I think Greenpeace are law-breaking thugs. I think they're monstrous hypocrites, especially when it comes to their own use of fuel. I think they're positively racist in their opposition to the use of vitamin-enhanced golden rice to save the lives of millions of kids in the third world. But for years I've been saying to anti-oil sands protesters, how come you never protest against Saudi Arabia or Iran or Venezuela? How come you only protest against the gentlest oil producer in the world, Canada? Groups like Greenpeace always mumble and avert their eyes when I say that. Like Tabitha Saudi, they thrive on a feeling of moral superiority when you remind them that they're fine with Sharia oil with terrorist oil, they get embarrassed. Well, finally, Greenpeace went after someone other than Canada about oil. They may well deserve to go to prison for 15 years, I don't know the facts. But for one moment, their hypocrisy level dipped down from 100% oh, to just 90%. But you know as well as I do that Greenpeace will never protest against Russia again, just like you know that for the next 10 years, the only place where John Grayson and Tarek Lubani will be are in the salons of Toronto's rich ladies who lunch. Oh, and the green rooms of the CBC and the rest of the media party.